Well, we will continue with our series of messages from the book of Daniel. So if you have your Bibles with you, open your Bibles to the book of Daniel, chapter 3. The title of our message today is, Our God is Able to Deliver Us. Our God is Able to Deliver Us. And of course, the story of Daniel. Actually, we're not going to talk about Daniel today. We're going to talk about his three other friends. Remember his three other friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. All right. We're going to talk about them today. Well, in chapter 3, we will read that Nebuchadnezzar had an idea that he's going to build this statue to be worshipped by him and to be worshipped by all the peoples under the kingdom of Babylon. And in this passage, we will read that this was a pretty big statue. It's like 90 cubits. It's 90 cubits and 6 cubits wide. Actually, the, uh, the, the different commentators or theologians uh, who made comments about it said, well, if this is exactly, if, if the statue is like 90 cubits high and, and six cubits wide, it would be a very, very tall, skinny, uh, uh, tall and skinny uh, a structure or statue. And so one of the assumptions that, uh, uh, that commentators have and, and scholars have is that maybe, he said, they said, if we will do it like based on just the right or proportioned size, maybe, they said, the statue itself would be about 48 feet because 90, uh, 60 cubits is like 90 feet, okay? He said maybe the statue itself is about 40 feet high, so that would be a proportionate size, okay? And then it was probably something that sat on a pedestal which was about 50 feet high. So making it 90 feet tall, standing on or sitting on a pedestal. But it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter. The, the, what the, te- the Bible is telling is that he built this statue. And it's a statue made of gold. Made of gold. Now, in chapter 2, if you remember, <laughs> it's made of gold. Can you imagine that? 90 feet tall, made of gold. All right? So anyway, if you remember, in chapter 2, he had a dream that Daniel interpreted. The dream was a statue with a head of gold, right? And when Daniel interpreted to Nebuchadnezzar this statue, Daniel said, the head of gold represents you and your kingdom. That's what Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar. Okay? Because it's supposed to be a, a prophecy consor- concerning at least the four kingdoms that will come. The gold represents the kingdom of Babylon, and then the silver, and then later on the iron, and later on the, the combination of iron and clay represented the Macedonian, the, Medo, the Medo-Persian, the Macedonian, and then the Roman Empire. Okay? And then, of course, the kingdom later on that, that Daniel talked about is the kingdom of Jesus Christ, the one that struck down the statue and turned it into ashes. And then this kingdom is the kingdom that lasts forever. And Daniel was prophesying about the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm just telling you this because when you look at chapter 3, with Nebuchadnezzar, all of a sudden having an idea of a gold statue, could it be that he had gotten the idea from the vision that he received that The gold head of the statue in his dream represents him and his kingdom. And so now he had an idea of building a gold statue to be worshipped by everyone. And his command was this. At a certain time of the day, everyone will hear a loud music or sound, it says here, And as soon as everyone hears this sound, everyone is supposed to get down on their knees and bow down to this statue. 
So, he had like an opening ceremony of this. He called in all the satraps, which would be the governors, okay, of all the uh, places in, in, in Babylon. And uh, he called them all, and he says that at that moment that you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, psaltery, bagpipe, and all kinds of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. This king, who had a dream, who could, he couldn't, uh, I guess, remember everything and did not know what the meaning was, remember, was the king who received an interpretation from someone who told him that it's the God of heavens who revealed it to him. And he was surprised to know that Daniel knew about it and interpreted it for him. And all of a sudden, this same king, a tyrannical king, a self-centered, self-absorbed king, came up with an idea of building a golden statue to be worshipped by every one. Could it be that he is thinking that this golden statue represents him? Because he's the one who made it. Right? And whoever does not fall down will be thrown into a fiery, blazing furnace. He just had an encounter with the God of heavens through Daniel. And now all of a sudden he comes up with an idea that this now is the God that is to be worshipped. In chapter 2 he declared that everyone should recognize the God of Daniel who is also the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Right? And now he comes up with another God. Why? I believe he's so self-centered, thinking that he knows better than anyone and he is more powerful than anyone in the world, he thought, at this point. And so he came up with another God. And when powerful man like Nebuchadnezzar gets into a certain kind of position like he was in at that point, they will make their subject bow to their God also. Because that's how it is. Ungodly, powerful men make their subject bow to their God. They decide who the God is that is to be worshipped. So even though the God of Daniel, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego already told him things that he could not actually uh, uh, even imagine could happen, he still came up with his own God. Why? Because people like Nebuchadnezzar, is so self-absorbed self -absorbed that he thinks that he is better and more powerful than anyone in the world. And so he will make everyone else bow to his God. It could be a statue. It could be an idea. It could be a worldview in our situation nowadays. Powerful men in position of power and leadership will be tempted always to make others be subjected to them and to their will. 
because power corrupts and absolute power absolutely corrupts. That's why it's very dangerous to give power to one man or one group over everyone else. Our founding fathers realized that. They realized that. Why? Because the scripture does tell us that the heart of all things is the most deceitful. There are many people who, who started with the right motive and intention. But once power is given to them and it becomes an absolute power, then they take advantage of it and make others submit to their will instead of the will of God. It happens not only in politics, it happens even in churches. I believe that's one of the reasons why in the church, the Apostle Paul made it clear that it has to be a group of elders and not just one elder or one person. That's why we have models in the scripture of how everyone is involved, basically, in a lot of the decisions made. Why? Because when you put one person or one group with absolute power over everyone, they will make their subject vow to their God. It could be a statue, like I said earlier. It could be an idea. It could be a world view. But it is anything but God of the universe. It could be anything that is against the revealed word of God, which is the Bible. That's why it's so important to always go back to what the scripture tells us. Because the scripture is the very word of God. We are actually experiencing this even now in our society where men and women, people from all walks of life with different religious beliefs are being made to accept things and vow to the wishes of the powers that be. Right? To an idea? To a world view? Or maybe a statue? And there are ungodly people under them who will watch to see if you are not submitting. There are, just like what happened here. So they had the ceremony, they blasted the music, everyone bowed down, but then someone came up to Nebuchadnezzar and said, hey, uh, O king, live forever. Didn't you say that everyone is supposed to bow down? Everyone is supposed to bow down to the statue when they hear the loud music? Everyone is supposed to bow? Well, said, well, there is a group of people here who are Jews, who did not bow down, gave the specific names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They did not bow down. Nebuchadnezzar was furious, was angry. He said, is that so? Well, bring these three men to me. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so they came to him, and he said to them, Hey, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, is it true that you did not bow down to worship the golden statue? Is that true? 
This is what it says in verse 14. Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? I'm going to give you another chance. King Nebuchadnezzar said, If you are ready at the moment, that you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, and bagpipe, and all kinds of music to fall down and worship the image that I have made very well. But if you do not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hand? So do you think your God can deliver you out of my hands? Well, in verse 16, this is what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. He's saying, we're not even going to explain to you. We know we cannot change your mind. You've already made a decree. You're going to throw in the furnace those who did not bow down to worship your image. So that means they're saying we're not even going to argue with you. We're not going to argue with you. And so he said, if it be so, that you throw us into the furnace, basically, is what they're saying. Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us. That's the title of our message. Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O oh, king. They did not even flinch. They said, you know that I can throw you in the furnace and no one can stop me from doing that, is what Nebuchadnezzar was telling them. But they stood in front of the king and said, O oh, king, we're not even going to argue with you. We're not even going to explain anything to you. But this is what we know. The God that we serve, he is able to deliver us from the furnace. And he is able to deliver us out of your hands. You see, this scripture is telling us that godly people will not bow. Godly people will not bow to an ungodly image. Godly people will not bow to the desires of ungodly people that will violate their belief in the God that they serve. Because they know they are God. They know the God of the universe. They know that he's the one who's, who created everything. They know that he's the one who sustained everything. They know that he's the one who loves them more than anyone else in the universe could love them. And so they have made up their mind and their decision that they will not bow to another God. That there is only one God that they will serve. You see, there are people like these men who told Nebuchadnezzar who will try to pressure the people of God to bow down to the idol. What will these people do? Well, they will mock you. They will ridicule you. In our society now, they call it canceling you. 
many years ago in the Philippines, I, I did a, uh, uh, actually it was a TV show. It's called, What Would Jesus Do? And uh, one of our, uh, one of our uh, episodes was about homosexuality. Well, I did not know, actually, that you can watch it on YouTube now. So when my daughter was in, was in high school, is that they were looking at people on, they were Googling people. And so he said, hey, uh, my daughter said, yeah, we can Google my dad. <laughs> so they Googled me and found a lot <laughs> on the internet about my, my name. And one of them was the TV show that I did. And so actually recently, my, my daughter and I and my wife were talking about this, and, and my daughter said, hey, Dad, do you remember that time we found your, your TV show? And we, we watch it with my friends, and it's about homosexuality. And she said, you know what could happen to you? I said, what? You can be canceled. <laughs> I said, what? I said, yes. You watch it again, and look at all the things you said there. He said, you can be canceled. Well, I said, canceled by who and on what? <laughs> I said, I'm not planning on running a, for public office or anything. <laughs> I said, but, but you don't have to. If people decide to just cancel you, they can pull out all the things, all the sermons that you preach, and you can instantly be canceled. Because that is what they do now. You get canceled. In some countries, not only that you will be canceled, you will be treated as a lawbreaker because there are already laws set stating that if you said anything that could be construed as a hate speech, which could be a speech that is against a protected class of people. You could be in prison for it. A lawbreaker you will become if you choose to not bow. If you choose to not bow, you will be a lawbreaker. But just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, godly people will not bow. Why? Because they will only bow to the God who created the universe. Because they believe that God is able to deliver. But then we have to see verse 18. Look at verse 18. After they said, he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But look at verse 18. But even if he does not. Even if he does not. Let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. See, this passage is telling us that we know that God is able to deliver. But there are times when he chooses not to give us an earthly deliverance. Sometimes he decides, you know what, I'll just take you to heaven now. <laughs> you see, our problem sometimes is that 
We want the earthly deliverance more than the eternal deliverance. And sometimes that is what people are trying to tell us. Let's see if your God can deliver you from this now. And if God so chooses not to, then they mock you even more or mock your God. And sometimes that's our thinking when we pray. It's like, God, you, you better deliver me now because it's your name on the line here right now. Right? As if it's up to us to protect God. But actually, God does not need our protection. What God wants from us is to trust him even if, even if, That means even if I lose my job, even if I lose my life, even if I lose my loved ones, even if, even if, Because the day will come when that could actually be the deciding factor for us. For Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they understood that God has a mind of his own. And we have to understand that. We know that God is for us. We know that already. Because he gave his son, Jesus Christ, to us. God is able to deliver his people. He delivers us at times so that we can continue to serve here on earth. He does it sometimes miraculously. Just like what happened to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were thrown into the furnace. The people who threw them in the furnace got killed by the heat of the furnace because it was heated seven times more than the usual. But Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego remained safe in the furnace. As a matter of fact, when, when, when the king looked into the furnace, I don't know how, how far or how close he was, but apparently when the door was shut, maybe there was a, a hole that you can peek into. And he said, he saw four men. Didn't we just throw in three men? But, but I see four of them. And one of them looked like the image of the Son of God. He did not know exactly what he was talking about, but he, looked, he saw someone in there that look like not an ordinary human being with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he saw that all four of them were alive and not getting burnt up. And so he ordered the furnace to be opened. And he called into Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out! And they walked out of the furnace, not even singed, they did not even have the smell of fire or smoke on them. That's a miraculous deliverance. And we see a lot of that in the scripture of how God miraculously saved his people. But there are also times when God did not miraculously save his people. They did it by what theologians call special providence. Like, for example, in the book of Acts, when Paul was beaten, and then he was allowed to go to Rome, and then they found out, his nephew actually found out that there's like 40 men who have made a vow to kill him, that they will not eat until they have killed Saul or Paul. And so when Paul heard about this, he told the commander about it. 
And the commander ordered that Paul be guarded by 200 men so that he can reach Rome. That's how God protected Paul. Through a special providence. God could have protected him without the 200 men traveling with him to protect him, right? But no, God chose 200 men to go with him. So he was protected until he reached Rome. You see, God protects us and delivers us miraculously and by special providence. But sometimes he wants us to take us to heaven. What we know is this, by the blood of Jesus Christ, we already have the eternal protection of God upon us. That even if he does not provide our earthly deliverance, he has already provided eternal deliverance for us through his son, Jesus Christ. And that's the good news for all of us. We are assured that God will deliver his people. And if you are a part of the people of God, you are assured. We are assured. He will surely deliver us.